Okay, so um, our last hypothesis test is called the goodness of fit test. And while that's not good English, it is a good test. What it allows us to do is to determine if two distributions are the same or not, or close enough to each other to be called the same or not. Now, in order to do this test, we actually need a new distribution. Um, and this distribution is called the chi-squared distribution. The uh, notation for chi-squared chi, whoop, I can't do that, hang on, there we go, is kind of a fancy x squared. All right, that's the Greek letter chi. So that's the notation that we're going to use for the test statistic and the critical value. All right, now the chi-squared distribution is different from some of our other distributions in that it is not symmetric. All right, the chi-squared distribution has, uh, it, it's basically a right skew. All right, the shape of the chi-squared distribution depends on degrees of freedom, just like the student t distribution does. Uh, as, the number of de as the number of degrees of freedom decrease, the chi distribution becomes more and more nearly symmetric nearly being the key word there. It's never going to be symmetric because the chi-squared distribution, except for the initial rendering of it, uh, has an endpoint. All right, it doesn't continue to the left of the y-axis. Uh, the values for chi-square are non-negative, hence does not <laughs> uh, end up uh, to the left of the y-axis. This is the uh, diagram that we're going to be using for chi-squared right here. All right. Now, the test that we're going to be doing using this distribution is called the goodness of fit test. It's an inferential procedure, right, a hypothesis test, that's used to determine whether a frequency distribution follows a specific distribution. All right, and we'll look at an example in a few minutes, uh, a problem example. Okay, uh, but basically, <clears throat> if you're doing quality control for a company and you know that your product is supposed to follow a specific distribution, you can use this test to determine if your equipment needs calibration or not. All right, so that's, that's, a, that's a good practical example of how you would use this test. Now, <clears throat> in order to do a chi-squared test, we need to have some conditions. All right, first of all, there have to be n independent trials of the experiment, and we have to have three or more trials. All right, so if we let p represent the probability of observing the first outcome, e, all right, and we're going to subscript. So the first outcome, the first probability for the first outcome are going to have subscripts of one. All right, um, and then P2 goes with E2 and so on. We basically have a probability distribution. The expected count for each possible outcome is given by the expected value, right? We've talked about the expected value. It is uh, the number of total outcomes times the probability of that outcome. All right, so one of the things we're going to have to do for our problems is to calculate the expected value for our distribution. All right, what the, what we, what the numbers tell us the distribution should be, and then we compare that to what the distribution actually is for our sample. All right, and then like any hypothesis test, we need a test statistic, All right? So we're going to have two sets of values. We're going to have the observed values that we get from our sample, and then we're going to have the expected values that we calculate, what we expect the distribution should be. And, <coughs> excuse me. All right, and the way we calculate our test statistic chi-squared is with this formula here. Now notice, this is a formula similar to the way we did the formula for standard deviation by hand in that it's a summation. 
All right, so you take your first observed value minus your first expected value, and then you square that, and then you divide by your first expected value. Then you put a plus sign down, and you do it for the second one, and you do it for the third and the fourth, however many you've got, and then you add those numbers up. All right, so this calculation will follow a chi-squared chi distribution as long as we have k minus 1 degrees of freedom. All right? So however many categories we have, right, because i is summed up over the categories, okay? So k minus 1 degrees of freedom, k is going to be the number of categories. I actually call it n later on, all right? Um, but actually, that's confusing, so I'll probably change that in my description as we get there. All right, so uh, let's see, provided that all expected frequencies are greater than or equal to 1. Okay, so when we calculate our expected values, all right, they should be greater than or equal to 1. And no more than 20% of the expected values are less than 5. All right, so those two conditions have to apply to any problem that we do. All right, so I'm just going to run through the procedure quickly and then we'll talk about the chi-squared table and then we can work on a problem. All right. So now what's a little different about this particular type of problem is how we state the null and alternative hypothesis. So now remember, the null hypothesis is the statement of no change. So that statement says everything is as we expect it to be. So for this type of a test, the null hypothesis is going to be that the random variable follows the distribution that we are testing against. All right, so that would mean that h1 has to be the opposite of that, which is that the random variable does not follow the distribution in the null hypothesis. So since our default is always that the null hypothesis is true, all right, if we find out that our test statistic falls in the tail of the curve, that it is unusual under the assumption that the null, null hypothesis is true, then we get to reject the null hypothesis. Then we have enough evidence to suggest that the distributions are not the same. And in the case of a quality control problem, that would mean that you would need to recalibrate your machinery. All right, and then decide on a level of significance. Remember, you'll be given the level of significance, but again, depending on the seriousness of a type one error, you're gonna calculate your expected counts, all right? So all of your expected values for the distribution. You are going to verify that the requirements for the goodness of fit test are satisfied. All of those expected counts that you just calculated have to be greater than or equal to 1, and no more than 20% of them can be less than 5. All right. all right, so once we have all that done, we're going to calculate the test statistic and then we're going to take a look at our diagram, see where it falls, and state a conclusion. Okay? All right, so in a general sense, this is the same as every other hypothesis test we've done. All right, we're just using a different distribution. Okay, so let's take a quick look at the chi-squared table. All right, so I'm going to pull that into view here. All right, so this is our chi-squared table. It is in our book. It is table eight, it is on page A15, all right? And this reads exactly like the student T distribution table reads. Across the top, you've got your alphas, all right? And along the side, you've got your degrees of freedom. So if I'm doing, now keep in mind, these are all one-tailed tests. Chi-squared is always a one-tailed test for us, for goodness of fit, all right? The chi-squared distribution is used for other things, um, including um, hypothesis testing for the standard deviation, in which case you could have a two-tailed test. But for us, for goodness of fit, all right, this is a one-tailed test always. So if I have, let's say, degrees of freedom, let's say I have um, an alpha 0.05, all 
and I have n, let's see, n equals 10 categories, or k equals 10 categories, which would make my degrees of freedom 9, right? I would read over to 0.05, and my chi-square value would be 16.919. All right, notice the chi-square values get really big, all right? Uh, don't let that throw you off. That might happen. All right, so I'm going to move that back out of the way. And we're going to take a look at a problem. All right, and here's what I'm going to change just so we don't run into any confusion. Where's my pen? There's my pen. All right, between me and the book. Oh, wait, I need my eraser. I am going to take that out and I'm going to change that over to K. So K is 6. All right. <clears throat> All right, so let's look at this problem. According to the manufacturer of M&Ms, 13% of plain M&Ms uh, in a bag should be brown, 14% should be yellow, 13% red, 24% blue, 20% orange, and 16% green. A student randomly selects a bag of plain M&Ms. He counts the number of M&Ms that were each color and obtains the results shown in this table right here. Test whether plain M&Ms follow the distribution stated by M&M Mars at the alpha equals 0 0.05 level of significance. All right, now I've set up some of what you're gonna need to set up to do this problem. So the first thing you're gonna wanna do is We'll take the table, right? Here's the table that we were given. I've added some information to it. All right, so the first thing I did was, well, the values are just the color. Observed values, which we're gonna call O, and expected values, which we're gonna call E. I've also included the percents next to each color because we're gonna need those percents to calculate the expected values. The other thing we're gonna need is the total number of M&Ms in the package, and that is actually our N, right? So N is 400. So when I come up here to calculate the expected values, I'm going to do a series of calculations, right? Because I have to take the probability that we get a brown M&M, which is 13%, and multiply that by the number of M&Ms in the bag to find out how many M&Ms I should expect to be brown. So that is going to be 0.13 times 400. All right, and when I do that, I get 52. I'm just going to, let me just pull something up here so that I, come on. Yes, 52. All right, and then I have to take 14%, which is the probability of getting a yellow M&M times 400. And when I do that, I get 56. And then red M&Ms is 13 again. So that's going to be 52 again. Uh, blue, let's see, blue is 24, so 0 0.24 times 400. And that is 96. And then orange is 20%, so 0.2 or 0.20 times 400. And that is 80. And then 0.16 for green times 400, which is 64. All right, so what this is telling me is, according to the M&M Mars company, I should expect a bag of 400 M&Ms to have 52 that are brown, 56 that are yellow, 52 that are red, 96 that are blue, um, 80 that are orange, and 64 that are green. Okay, so you can see, is that right? Hang on. Yes, that is right. Um, so you can see that the distribution doesn't match exactly, all right? It's close in places. It's not close in other places, all right? So the, the question is, is it close enough to say that they're the same, all right? 
So now we need to set up our hypothesis test here. All right, now the nice thing about goodness of fit is when we set up our hypothesis test, the H0 and the H1 are, are standardized, right? H0 is that the distributions are the same. The distributions are the same. And you can be more specific here. All right, you could say the distribution of M&Ms in the student's package is the same as the distribution of M&Ms specified by M&M Mars. I'm just going to say the distributions are the same. All right, and then H1 is that the distributions are different or not the same. The distributions, I'll, make, I'll keep the same language, are not the same. So remember, as we're doing the test, all right, it's H1 that we're assuming, I'm sorry, it's H0 that we're assuming. And if we end up too far out on the chi-squared distribution, we'll be able to say that there's enough evidence to support H1. <coughs> okay. All right, so I'm gonna, just like I do with the others, I'm gonna draw myself a picture. Right, and I'm going to draw myself a chi-squared distribution, which is kind of looks like, all right, well, kind of looks like that. And I'm going to have a cutoff from the table, which I'll get in a minute. All right, so that's my tail. This is my do not reject region. Do not reject. Re oh, boy. Spelling is a thing today. Let's try that again. Right, keep the R. Do not reject H0. Okay. All right. So we have, okay, what else do we have here? We have K equals 6, which is the number of categories we've got, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So the degrees of freedom for the table is going to be 6 minus 1, or 5. And then the problem also says to use alpha equals 0 0.05. Again, remember, these are always one-tail tests. All right, so we're going to pull the table back into view here. And we're looking at an alpha of 0 0.05, so we're in this column. And our degrees of freedom are 5. So I'm just going to follow that over, and I get a critical value of 11.070. Right, so let's move that back out of the way. So 11.070. All right, so that's my, that's my benchmark there. All right, now, <clears throat> doing the chi, stop that. Doing the chi-squared calculation. All right, I'm going to show you this, and if you have a TI-83 calculator, pay attention, because the TI-83 does not do this test. Okay, so if you have a TI-83 calculator, you're going to have to do this by hand. All right, um, you're not going to be able to get a p-value uh, for this. All right, so let's start here. So remember, the chi-squared test value is going to be observed minus expected squared divided by expected. All right, so remember, our observed values are in this column. Our expected values are in this column. All right, so this is going to be observed, 57, minus expected, 52, squared, divided by expected, 52. All right, so this is for brown. Plus, next one on the list, 64 minus 56 squared divided by 56. This is for yellow. Plus, 
Next one on the list, 54 minus 52 squared divided by 52. All right, this is for red. Plus, uh, next one is 75 minus 96 squared divided by 90. Oops, the heck happened there? All right, hang on. <sighs> Seriously? Oh my god, I know why that happened. Hang on. Uh, ink to shape off. Can I erase that now? Ah, oh, come on. All right, I'm just going to, we'll just move on. <laughs> Pretend that's not there. Where was I? Uh, I did red, so I'm up to blue. Uh, so that's going to be 75 minus 96 squared over 96. That's my fault for playing around with the settings and not putting them back. Uh, and that one, what did I say? That one is blue. And then orange is going to be 86 minus 80 squared over 80. So that's orange. I think I can fit one more in. Plus, last one, 64 minus 64 for squared over 64, and that is green. Notice that last one is going to be zero. Okay. Now, I'm not going to do this because it's just going to take forever on the video, and that's really boring TV. So um, my advice to you, when you calculate this, don't try to do it all in one step. All right? Calculate one term at a time. All right? If you want to do like all of the brown at once and get a value, write it down. Make sure you are taking, I, I would, to be safe, take the entire decimal, but make sure you're taking at least six decimal places here. All right. The reason for that is, in the end, we need three decimal places. All right. Notice the chi-square value up here is the three decimal places. So you need to have this rounded to three decimal places you need to take six decimal places to avoid any round off errors. Remember, this is for the online homework as well. Actually, more for the test. I'm not sure I have any of these in the online homework, but for the exam, which is also online, you need to make sure you're taking into account any possible round off errors. So calculate each one of these to six places. Then add them up, okay? Now, I actually did this in advance so I wouldn't have to sit here and figure out ah, except of course it disappeared off my screen so give me just a second okay so that adds up to six point seven four four okay all right so when I put my chi squared on the chart since this is eleven point zero seven zero six is gonna fall on this side right this is six point seven four four and actually let me just so I don't get any emails later let me make that look a little bit more like an 11 and a little less like a 4. 11.070. Okay, so that means my chi-square value falls in the do not reject region, which means I make an initial conclusion of do not reject H0. All right, so I now I have to state my conclusion. All right, so remember our hypotheses up here. If we're not rejecting H0, that means we're saying the distributions are the same, but when you state your conclusion, you have to state it the same way we did in all the other problems. There's not enough evidence to support the claim that the distributions are different, right? So 
There is not enough evidence to conclude that the distributions are different. All right. Um, you can use this pretty much as a model for the problems you're going to see. All right. Um, all right. So this is, again, the process. Actually, it all fits on one screen. Look at that. This is the process for doing a problem by hand. Now, remember, if you have a TI-83 calculator and not a TI-84, in all likelihood, you do not have a goodness of fit test. Um, now, if you have a TI-84, like this one here, all right, then you have a goodness of fit in stat tests. All right, I'm going to go up from the bottom right here. All right, now on the TI-83s, at least the older ones, you will only see chi-squared tests. That is not the same thing. All right, what you're looking for is chi-squared GOF test. If that is not there, this is your procedure, all right? This is the way you're going to have to do it, okay? Um, all right, uh, so let's talk to the people who do have this test on their calculator. All right, so, oh, you know what? Let me, uh, hang on. Let me bring that back up again for a second because we'll take a look at what it needs. All right, so <clears throat> the goodness of fit test needs the observed values in L1 and the expected values in L2. So notice, it wants you to input the expected values. So regardless of how you're doing this test, if you're doing it p-value or if you're doing it by hand, then you're going, you still have to calculate the expected values, all right? So up to, up to this point here, everyone has to do the test the same way. All right, it's just saving this calculation in the end, all right, that the, uh, calc that the calculator will save you. All right, so let's get out of this. Let's go into stat and edit. Now I've already put in the observed values, so you can see it matches this first column here, observed. So what I have to do now is put in the expected values. So that's gonna be 52. 56, 52, 96, 80, and 64. All right, and I'm just going to take a quick second to double check. Yes, those are all correct. All right, so you're going to quit out of this to the home screen, go back into stat, over to tests, goodness of fit, and then everything is lined up. The only thing you might have to enter is your degrees of freedom. So our degrees of freedom is five, so I don't have to change anything here. And I'm going to go down to calculate, and we're going to calculate. So the test gives you the test statistic, right? That calculation that we did. All of this is right there, okay, 6.744. The p-value, okay, the p-value for this is 0.24. All right, so if we're using the p-value to make the conclusions, all right, eh, okay, so the p-value is 0.24. All right, we only need two decimal places. Our alpha value is 0 0.05. All right, so the p-value is greater than alpha. That means the probability of making a type one error based on the data that we collected, our sample, is higher than what we want to allow for a type one error. So this is the situation where we reject H0. All right, and that matches what we got there. All right, using the by hand method. 
All right. So the the um, the calculator, really, all the calculator does using the p-value method is saves you having to do this calculation here by hand. All right. So if you don't mind doing this calculation by hand, then go ahead and do it. Um, if you've got a TI-84 and want to use it to get the test stat, you can do that. Okay. Uh, or you can pull the p-value out and and use that to make the determination. All right. All right. So that is that is our last hypothesis testing um, situation. All right. So this is. 12.1 in our textbook and I'm gonna upload this as soon as I get the video rendered.